Michael Saylor was born on February 4th, 1965, in Lincoln, Nebraska. As a child, Saylor was often on the move, due to his father being an Air Force sergeant. By the time he was 11 years old, Michael and his family settled in Fairborn, Ohio, near the Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. From an early age, Michael had high ambitions. I um, thought I was going to be a fighter pilot astronaut. Right. But uh, so I learned to fly in the Air Force, and in my senior year, uh, Reagan won the Cold War. They ramped down the military, cut it in half, and I had a macroeconomic event combined with just a random, uh, a random uh, personal event that catapulted me into business. The macroeconomic event was the end of the Cold War, the drawdown of um, the United States military. Uh, and uh, the United States had paid for my education and I was like on the hook to serve. I thought I'd be in the military 10 years. And um, my final flight physical, my senior year at MIT, they diagnosed me with a benign heart murmur. And that disqualified me from flying jets. Although he would never live up to his childhood dreams of being a fighter pilot, Taylor would go on to run one of the largest software companies in the world. You know, I, I, the number one thing I got from MIT was confidence and the ability to think for myself. That's the number one thing. Uh, my, my first serious formative memory of MIT is I walk into a material science class. There's 350 people in the lecture hall. The professor walks out and he is a consultant for NASA. And he's the top of his profession. And he designed these tiles that went on the space shuttle. And he takes one of the tiles and it's burnt. It's got streaks on it. He holds up front of the class. He says, you know, on the space shuttle's last re-entry, this tile burned off the space shuttle. Nobody at NASA knows why, and we're not sure how to fix it. What do you think? Taylor was taught early on at MIT, you were going to have to figure it out. Nobody was going to give you the answers that you were looking for. It was this independent thinking that led Michael Saylor to the biggest decision of his young life. And Michael, how old were you when you created founded MicroStrategy? 24. I was two years out of MIT. Wow. Uh, I suppose the question would be, what gave you the confidence to think that at that age you could go and start a technology company? When I was three years old, my first memory was standing in a room and it was like a Sunday afternoon after my parents went to church and the Sunday afternoon ritual was people come over to the house for a potluck supper and they all, they all bring a dish. And so I was three years old and, and uh, I'm standing there in the foyer and I know that the kids are supposed to go in the backyard. The adults with the food are supposed to drop it on the, you know, in the dining room on the left. And the adults without the food are supposed to go to the living room on the right. And so I'm standing there directing traffic and people come in and I'm pointing them toward the left, the right, or telling the kids to go in the back. And then there are some adults that are ignoring me. And all I can think is, what's wrong with these people? Why don't they know that I'm in charge here? I know what's going on. At the young age of 24, Michael Saylor started his business intelligence software company, MicroStrategy. And only nine years after that, MicroStrategy went public. MicroStrategy is a business that operates software that analyzes data for large companies. But a quick Google search of MicroStrategy and the first thing that most people associate with it pops up, Bitcoin. In March 2020, we witnessed one of the worst market crashes in history. Since then, many publicly traded companies have followed suit. But what gives Michael Saylor his conviction in Bitcoin? Well, being a graduate of MIT, Saylor might look at technology a little bit differently than the average person. At the point that, that the economy shut down and Main Street went to, you know, what is it, 75% of, or 60% of economic output, you know, which is pretty obvious to anybody walking around. You could see that the economic output was compressed by 20, 30, 40%. At the point that that happened, and then we saw a V-shaped recovery in Wall Street, it's like a set of financial assets had an immediate V-shaped recovery, and a set of actual operational assets had not a recovery. And, and I'm very sensitive to that because I live in both worlds. Part, personally, I'm an investor. I'm a big tech investor in my personal portfolio for a decade. And so I rode, I rode that wave and I know what it's like to be an investor and think like an investor. 
my other day job is I run a company and I have thousands of employees and thousands of customers and we have to produce something. We have to make something, market the thing, sell the thing, service the thing in a competitive world. And, uh, and so when you're, when you're on Main Street and you're thinking about selling and, and, and doing something, you have one set of requirements and when you're on Wall Street, you have a different set. And so I, I think when I saw that Wall Street had an immediate recovery and Main Street did not, I think, I think that uh, that caused me to lose a, a bit of my, well, what, what would be the word? It's like, uh, it's, it's, it shakes your faith. Yeah. Remove the blinders in, in the to system. some degree. Yeah. Shakes your faith in the system. And, 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 you know, the first thing that has to happen is, well, if stocks are, if all the stocks are immediately recovering, even though Disneyland is closed, right? Yeah. If, if you know, even though the airlines are, are down 95%, but airline stocks are moving up. If, if that's happening, then you have to ask the question, why is that happening? And that leads you to start to focus upon the, the role of central banks in Wall Street and the EU and the Fed. Instead of a hesitant approach, Michael Saylor and MicroStrategy took a full dive into Bitcoin and became the first publicly traded company to add Bitcoin to its balance sheet. Since then, many publicly traded companies have followed suit. In 2012, Michael Saylor released a book called The Mobile Wave. I mean, the theme of The Mobile Wave is, is every company is becoming a software company, whether they like it or not, to the extent that they provide a good or a service that touches the consumer. So unless you have a diamond mine or an oil well, you better become a good software company. And clearly, uh, Google, Facebook, Apple are the winners. Uh, the losers are companies that need to be great software companies, but either in denial and, and they're hoping that this is not going to happen, or they're just incapable of developing great software skills. What things die? What, what, what businesses go away? I mean, is that happening already? B businesses that are based upon uh, local, average, or, or mediocre provision of goods and services. If, uh, if the only reason you're here is because you're the only person with a printing press in Hong Kong and nobody else can afford to print a, a, a paper and ship it to you, then that's no longer the case. I mean, I would expect the New York Times is going to ship to 500 million people. And if it doesn't, then someone else is going to come along that can ship a paper in English language to 500 million people. You could say that Sailor was ahead of the curve, showing a great understanding of technology and where the future was headed an investor in Facebook, Google, and Amazon long before they were Wall Street favorites. 